Hi, welcome back. I'm Rachel. You're watching Calkind TV live from Sydney. This is the Economic Corner Show, where we update you on all the biggest global economic announcements. First economic update for the day is the International Energy Agency, or the IEA's report, called Net Zero by 2050. It's a roadmap for the global energy sector. This special report is the world's first comprehensive study of how to transition to a net zero energy system by 2050, while ensuring stable and affordable energy supplies, providing universal energy access, and enabling robust economic growth. It sets out a cost-effective and economically productive pathway resulting in a clean, dynamic, and resilient energy economy dominated by renewables like solar and wind instead of fossil fuels. The report also examines key uncertainties such as the roles of bioenergy, carbon capture and behavioural changes in reaching net zero. The International Energy Agency says that the world has a viable pathway to building a global energy sector with net zero emissions in 2050, but it is narrow and requires an unprecedented transformation of how energy is produced, transported and used globally. Energy groups must stop all new oil and gas exploration projects from this year if global warming is to be kept in check, says the report. Aside from drastically cutting fossil fuel consumption, an unprecedented jump in spending on low carbon technologies would also be acquired. Around $5 trillion in energy investments per year by 2030. That's up from around $2 trillion today. Now for updates on the Israel-Palestinian violence. U.S. President Joe Biden has, for the first time, publicly expressed his support for a ceasefire as Israeli-Palestinian violence stretched into its second week. Biden spoke to Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday as the U.S. president faced rising criticism from American progressives who want his administration to exert more pressure to stop the hostilities in the Gaza Strip. Biden reiterated his firm support for Israel's right to defend itself against indiscriminate rocket attacks and welcomed efforts to address intercommunal violence and bring calm to Jerusalem. Now over in the UK, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's willing to offer Australia tariff-free access to British food markets, despite warnings that it could hit the country's agriculture. However, the Environment Secretary George Eustace and the Cabinet Office Minister Michael Gove have privately expressed reservations about the deal. This comes after the National Farmers Union assembled agricultural leaders from all four devolved nations on Tuesday to voice their concerns following reports of a split in the Cabinet over whether to approve a wide-ranging free trade deal with Australia. On the other hand, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has pointed to strong trade with China as evidence of an ongoing relationship, despite Beijing's criticism of Canberra, as opposition at Labour accused him of using alarmist rhetoric for domestic political gains. Bilateral ties have sunk to their lowest point in decades and China has in recent months moved to restrict imports of Australian products such as barley, wine and beef. That's after Morrison led calls for a global inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. But Morrison says sales of other commodities illustrate the relationship has not broken down. China is Australia's largest trading partner. In the past 12 months till March, Australia exported $116 billion worth of goods to China. That was down 0.6% from the previous year. Exports, however, have been supported by strong prices for iron ore, the largest single item in trade with China. Morrison's comments were reported as Labour Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong accused him of indulging in political opportunism in foreign affairs. Labour has previously largely backed the government's more assertive stance towards Beijing, but recent warnings from government officials raising the possibility of a conflict with China have weakened that unity. Some academics have also called for a change to Australia's 2018 foreign interference laws, which then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says was aimed squarely at China 
as well as Canberra's new powers to cancel agreements struck between states and foreign governments. The government in April used the 2020 legislation to cancel an agreement between Victoria's state and China on the Belt and Road Initiative. China Matters, that's a Sydney-based think tank that has been critical of Australia's policy towards China, says the laws are too broad and should be narrowed when a parliamentary committee examines the legislation later this year. Moving on now, the governor of the Bank of Japan, Haruko Kuroro, speak, spoke on the outlook for economic activity and prices and monetary policy. He said that Japan's economy has picked up as a trend, although it has remained in a severe situation due to the impact of COVID-19. With regard to the outlook, the economy is likely to recover with the impact waning gradually and supported by an increase in external demand, accommodative financial conditions and the government's economic measures. Thereafter, as the impact of COVID-19 subsides, it is projected to continue growing. After having registered a significant negative figure of minus 4.6% for the fiscal year 2020, the real GDP growth rate is projected to be 4% for fiscal year 2021, 2.4% for 2022 and 1.3% for fiscal year 2023 in terms of medians of the policy board members' forecasts in the April 2021 Outlook report. That's compared with the previous Outlook report released in January. The projected growth rates are higher, mainly for fiscal 2022. Now, this upward revision is against the background that the global economy is likely to continue to recover and a virtuous cycle is expected to intensify in Japan. He said that the bank will firmly pursue current monetary easing, thereby supporting the economy. Meanwhile, Taiwan's government has called for fair access to COVID-19 vaccines. That was during a meeting with senior Western diplomats as it faces a dwindling supply of shots during a spike in domestic infections. Taiwan has reported almost 1,000 new infections during the past week or so, leading to new curbs in the capital, Taipei, and a shocking population that has become accustomed to life carrying on almost as normal but its stock of vaccines is rapidly falling. It's only received a little more than 300,000 to date, all from AstraZeneca. At least two thirds of those have already been distributed. Taiwan Centers for Disease Control said in a statement on Wednesday that after a workshop on Tuesday with top US, British, Japanese and Australian diplomats in Taipei, that nowhere was immune from the pandemic's threat unless everyone controls it. Taiwan is mobilizing its diplomats to try to speed up access to more vaccines and is in talks with the United States for a share of the COVID-19 shots President Joe Biden plans to send abroad. The de facto U.S. ambassador to Taiwan, Brent Christensen, said at the same event that talking about COVID-19 vaccines can be a sensitive subject. That's according to a copy of his remarks published. Taiwan has ordered 20 million doses, mostly from AstraZeneca, but also from Moderna. No global shortages have curtailed supplies. The government says more vaccines are on the way and hopes domestically developed shots can start being rolled out before the end of July. On to another important update now. US, Canada and Mexico held robust trade deal talks with trade ministers and the new North American trade deal and pledged to fully enforce its higher standards while downplaying differences over a range of other irritants. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai on Tuesday urged her Mexican and Canadian counterparts to work together to implement, enforce and fulfill the terms of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. That's to maintain political support for the new trade deal. In remarks delivered to the first minister-level meeting, she says the three countries must take action to make it succeed. Moving on now to some economic data announcements. A measure of Australian consumer sentiment fell in May to break a three-month winning streak, which is a surprisingly downbeat reaction to the government's annual budget that has been branded as essential to securing economic recovery. The Westpac Melbourne Institute Index of Consumer Sentiment released on Wednesday fell 4.8%, partly retracing April's 6.2% jump. That's still left the index up 
28.5 on May last year when the country was only just emerging from widespread coronavirus lockdowns. The index reading of 113.1 also showed optimists comfortably outnumbered pessimists. Westpac Chief Economist Bill Evans says that the fall may also represent the disappointment in the federal budget as a very generous budget that was still unable to exceed the exuberant expectations of the co community. He noted sentiment amongst those surveyed pre-budget was almost identical to that or amongst those surveyed after the announcement. Now, the budget last week included tax breaks for business and workers, along with more spending on everything from aged care to infrastructure. The pullback in the index came across all its components, with the measure of family finances compared with a year ago down 5.4%, and that for finances over the next 12 months falling 6.9%. The outlook for the economy over the next 12 months dropped 3.5 percent after jumping more than 10 percent in April and for the next five years fell 6.7 percent. The measure of whether it was a good time to buy a major household item also dipped 1.5 percent. One bright spot was on the labour market with more consumers looking for the unemployment rate to fall in the year ahead. This measure actually improved to its best level in a decade. The housing market remained a hot topic with the survey's index of house price expectations holding at a historic high of 163.8. That's 40 points above its long-run average. Australian wages growth picked up from record lows last quarter, but was still nowhere close to the levels desired by the central bank, which has promised to not raise interest rates until inflation was substantially within its target band. The official wage price index rose 0.6% in the three months to end December, the Australian Bureau of Statistics reported today. The numbers are slightly above forecast for a 0.5% increase. Annual wage growth inched up to 1.5%, slightly above the record low pace of 1.4% in the fourth quarter. The public sector recorded its lowest annual rate of growth of 1.5%, while the private sector remained at 1.4 percent. Next up, we're going to talk about producer price index numbers from New Zealand. Now, New Zealand PPI input jumped 2.1 percent quarter on quarter in the first quarter. That's versus the expectation of 0 percent quarter on quarter. PPI output rose 1.2 percent quarter on quarter, above expectation of 0 percent. The largest output industry contributions were from electricity and the gas supply, which was up 17.4%. Petroleum and coal product manufacturing rose 12.2%. Daily cattle farming rose 5.1%. Moving on to something else now. Housing production in the United States fell in April due to the increased costs of building materials that have priced out potential home buyers. Overall housing starts decreased 9.5% to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 1.57 million units. That's according to a report from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the U.S. Census Bureau. The April reading of 1.57 million starts is the number of housing units builders would begin if development kept this pace for the next 12 months. Within this overall number, single-family starts decreased 13.4% to a 1.09 million seasonally adjusted annual rate. Moving on now, the UK labour market turned a corner in the first quarter of 2021 with payroll employment rising, unemployment falling faster than expected and hiring accelerating into the run-up to the economy reopening. The unemployment rate averaged 4.8% between January and March. That was down from 5.1% in the previous quarter. That's according to the Office for National Statistics. They reported on Tuesday. The employment rate rose by 0.2 percentage points to 75.2 percent, but remained 1.4 percentage points below its pre-pandemic level. Now for some positive news on the pandemic recovery phase. Denmark will reopen almost completely on Friday and will phase out use of its domestic coronavirus passport and even face masks over the summer as it aims to be one of the first European countries to return fully to normal from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Denmark's political parties agreed on Tuesday that public sector workplaces, universities, sports and music clubs, zoos, theme parks and saunas would open again from Friday. Lastly now, for the upcoming economic events to watch for the day. The Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank, that's over in the U.S., will host a conference where Robert Kaplan, he's the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve, and he'll moderate a session on fostering a resilient economy. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers will also speak at this federal conference. Still in the U.S., Walmart will announce its results later today, and they will for sure be keenly watched by all investors. That's all from me for now. That's all from the Economic, Record, Economic Corner. Keep watching Calkine TV for updates on the markets and the economy. I'm Rachel, signing off for now.